Hey, and thanks for watching. Today I'm going to help you analyze refinance risk with a refinance analysis tool that we have available to download on our website. And uh, let me just I'll walk you through first kind of the purpose of this tool and then how to implement it into your own models and into your own analysis. So the first thing we have here, when you download the model, uh, it'll open up and you'll see this condensed version of the, the one tab model that just shows you essentially this is the summary of the analysis. And I'll talk about this in a minute, but the first thing you'll want to do is you want to open up your assumptions. You'll either use this plus, or I prefer to use this two right here, and that opens up where we can drop in the assumptions. Now the thinking is this. Uh, you're a lender or a borrower, doesn't really matter, but a loan is secured in time zero. And that loan has some amortization period and then some term, and the term is less than the amortization period, which means at the end of the term, when the loan comes due, there will be a, b a balance, a balloon balance, that uh, is greater than zero. And it will be either your or some future uh, purchaser's responsibility uh, to pay off that balloon balance. And more than likely, you'll want to go back to the capital markets and secure a new loan to pay off the old loan. And so before you enter into an investment, you want to do some analysis to ensure that there is sufficient reason to believe that that loan can be paid off at some future date. So you, what, you'll, what you'll do is you'll come in here, blue fonted cells are input, uh, black cells are outputs, and you're going to drop in your net operating income assumptions for each year over your hold period. You're going to drop in your debt service assumption, assumptions, again, over your hold period. Uh, those, th those items would be modeled in some separate model or an Argus or, or, or somewhere else and then dropped in here. If you're using Excel, it's as simple as pulling this tab into your model and then linking these cells up to the, the relevant cells in your model. Same with debt service. Then you're going to drop in the value at time zero, zero the value when, you, when you're when you doing this analysis. More than likely, if you're acquiring the property, that's the purchase price. If you're the lender, it's what you value the loan at uh, funding. And then you'll put the loan balance in, again, time zero at, at time of funding, what the loan balance may be. So in this case, uh, you know, I've just created a fictitious property. I have a value. I have a loan, which constitutes, I believe, 65% of my uh, assumed value. And then I have net proceeds, and that really is the difference between what I say the value is and what, what the loan is. And then I'm going to drop in what the loan balance is at the end of each year. Uh, and again, the difference then being net proceeds. Now I've also dropped in uh, a NOI cap rate assumption. And the thought here, and, and you can override your value if, if you're going to use some other method to value the property in each period, but the most common method, right, is to take the next year's NOI and divide it by some cap rate. And so this gives you an opportunity to increase or decrease or keep the same depending on where you think the market's going, your cap rate that is driving your ultimate value. And with those assumptions in place, you have now a property level uh, based on just your base NOI, property level debt service coverage. Again, debt service coverage being your net cash flow before uh, debt service divided by the debt service amount. And in this case, that's simply your net operating income divided by, uh, you'll see here, your net operating income divided by your debt surf debt service. Again, net operating income assumes uh, uh, that there aren't any capital expenditures uh, below that line. Um, or in other words, this is an NOI debt service coverage. And then we have loan to value. And again, as the loan amortizes down and as the value increases, our loan to value further drops. And I guess I actually had uh, size this loan to about almost 64% loan. And then we have debt yield. And again, this is an NOI debt yield. And debt yield is that NOI, in this case, this NOI debt yield is NOI divided by the loan balance. And the thinking is if the lender were to take back the loan in that year, that would be the lender's yield uh, 
without any other debt, so on an unlevered basis, the lender's yield on its investment at that stage. So now we have the, the, the property level assumptions. We're gonna go ahead and drop in our refinance assumptions. Now, this is what do we think, uh, what do we think the assumptions for, for refinancing property, what, what do we think those assumptions are going to do over the whole period? And what I mean by that is, generally in the marketplace, there's some ceiling on uh, loan to values. So on senior debt, just throwing it out, you know, in our, our example here, we're, we're going to say that for this type of property, uh, we're not going to be able to get any more than 65% loan to value on our senior debt. And then market debt service coverage, there's kind of a floor on that. So lenders aren't going to lend more than 65%. They're also not going to lend on anything less than a one and a quarter debt coverage. That's my assumption in this case here. Market amortization, that my type of property in this market, it's a 30-year amortization, and that's going to drive my payment uh, amount, and that payment amount thus drives my debt coverage, and so this is an important uh, metric. 30 years is a pretty safe one, but you never know where, where the market could go in the future. And then we have a debt yield, so the, the lender's going to require some floor, some minimum debt yield, and that debt yield then would su help size the loan. Um, uh, in, in a similar way that debt coverage or loan to value size the loan. So there's this minimum debt yield. So I have the assumptions. Now, what I'm assuming here, I'm assuming that rates are going to climb over my hold period. And as a result, cap rates are going to climb and expected debt yields are going to climb. My debt yield in this case is a, just a spread over my cap rate a 2.5% spread over my cap rate. It's a simplistic way to think about it. Uh, but you are going to come up with your assumptions for where you think the market's going to go. And then uh, as a result of these assumptions, you get things like the loan amount at certain market debt yields. So for instance, at a 7% debt yield in year one, uh, on in year one NOI, that's a loan amount up to $7.285 million. And it just so happens that the loan amount in this year, the loan balance is 7.1. And so based on, on this metric, the, the property has sufficient cash flow to secure a loan that exceeds the loan balance and therefore the loan can be repaid. But again, that's just based on this one metric. However, on this metric, the loan to value, it's still okay, but loan to value in this case, because the value is slightly different as, as uh, cap rates are climbing, uh, the loan to value seven. Uh, let's see, my value ten point nine nine million. It's actually dropped some from where where we uh, paid uh, for the property, but it's still just enough, slightly over what our loan balance is in that year. So you can see just at at this very basic level, that's what we're doing. As we then continue, here we have interest rates. Uh, I'm assuming a fixed rate refinance on a 10-year uh, treasury with some spread above that treasury. I have what I'm calling here market spreads, and then I'm putting where I think treasury rates are going over the next 15 years. This isn't what I actually think. This is what, I, what I've put in as my assumptions. Uh, and so I assume, hey, treasuries are going to climb uh, by, in this case, 2.1% over 15 years. Uh, that's unlikely to happen. It'll probably be very different than that, but this is, you know, again, simplistically to show you how this works. And then I'm going to assume some spread above those treasuries becomes my mortgage interest rate. Again, this fixed rate. And so each year, this is what I, where I think fixed rate mortgages uh, based on a 30-year term, 65% loan to value, one and a quarter debt coverage, and a minimum seven. 7% yield is going to be um, have a market mortgage, mortgage interest rate of about 3.75%. And as rates climb, that uh, market mortgage interest rate climbs uh, together with some of these other assumptions, namely uh, my market debt yield. And so then I've dro now I've dropped in my assumptions, my refinance assumptions, my interest rate assumptions, and now it gets to the fun part. And so w with these assumptions in there, I'm going to clean up uh, my little tab here. I'm going to hide these assumptions. And I do that by just coming up here, either hitting this minus sign or this one. I'm just going to hit the one. We hid uh, our assumptions and now we're going to do the analysis. So we have our assumptions in place. 
we know what our base NOI is. That's what we dropped in up top. But in reality, NOI is not likely to be what we think it is. And we want to stress test this investment. We, we want to say, hey, if, if these scenarios happen, and you can have an upside and a, down, and a downside if you want. Um, I prefer just to look at the downside because I want to know at what point am I going to run into refinance issues uh, based on the assumptions that I dropped in about. So I have these different levels. Think of them as scenarios. So we have scenario one through five. Uh, at 0%, that's equal to my base case. And I'm always going to have a 0% in there so I can, I can see my base case against these other, these other scenarios. And then I'm going to have some reduction in NOI. And in this case, it has a percentage of NOI. And I'm just going to phase this up where I have a 5%, 10%, 15%, and 20% reduction in NOI over levels 2 through 5. And then you see those uh, calculated here. NOI after 5% reduction, etc. in each of the years of my 15-year analysis period in this case. And with that, then, we see if we have enough NOI uh, to create the value to hit the different, um, the different uh, refinance factors. Right, and so in order to refinance the property, we we need at least an L or we can't have an LTV over a certain amount. We can't have a debt coverage uh, under a certain amount, and we we need kind of the, the net of this ref refinance proceeds that exceed zero. If not, we're going to have to bring money to the table. Uh, refinance proceeds again being a function of uh, my debt yield, and you'll see here in year one. Oh, and, and by the way, if if you don't hit that um, that test, then these cells turn red. So any time that all five, actually, even better put, any time that any one of these is red, then in that scenario, uh, it doesn't matter if the others aren't red. In that scenario, it you you have some refinance, some serious refinance risk. So we see here on a base case in year one we're fine in all three uh, situations, which makes sense uh, because we're assuming some growth in NOI, uh, and so even our value drops a little bit, we're still okay. But even with a 5% reduction in NOI in year one, uh, we can't refinance this. In year two, however, NOI grows some, but a 5% reduction in year two's uh, assumed NOI, and we still can't refinance because we don't hit the debt coverage limit. Okay, um, and so you see how as we as we continue out, for instance, if we had a 20% reduction in NOI in each year over the first six years, we wouldn't be able to refinance this. However, you would eventually again if you hit the 20%, it would take until year 12 when you would be at a point where the loan is amortized down sufficiently that you could pay off the loan. So that's. Uh, refinance risk and analyzing that risk. There are other ways to do this. Uh, this is one of the ways I was taught. Um, I, I'd love to hear if you have other ideas, um, anything I could corporate, incorporate into my own uh, analysis and, and whatnot. And uh, any questions you have about this, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me. And thanks for your time.